Hello, I'm Rich Terring. I never listen to Nerdology <laughs> because I am way too cool. But carry on listening, nerds. This is Mark, and welcome to episode 32 of Nerdology, and I'm joined today by Ian Martin of 5 Minute Fiction. Hi, Ian. Hello, Mark. How are you? <laughs> I'm fine, thanks, Ian. How are you? I'm very good. I'm very good. good. I'm just enjoying a mojito. Oh, wow. I've only got a cup of tea. That makes me feel quite... Well, th- these are the different spheres we move in. Yeah, that's it. That's it. You <laughs> jet set are you. <laughs> I do my best. Ian, if you're unaware is the presenter of a rather fabulous podcast called Five Minute Fiction. Do you want to give it a little plug before we get started, Ian? Uh, I'd love to. That's very kind of you. Um, Five Minute Fiction uh, is a show where essentially it's very simple. I just talk about a a novel every week um, for approximately five minutes, sometimes 10, sometimes 20 uh, depending on if I've, you know, actually got a lot to say about it or not. Um, And then surrounding that, there are various... Uh, bits and pieces that I do, which are, I think of them as being incredibly funny. Some people <laughs> think they're just a, a, the sound of a man having a nervous breakdown um, while talking You've to himself. You've had some uh, interesting guests, haven't you? I've, well, we've been very lucky to have several guests, some of whom sound quite close to the people they're supposed to be, some of whom less so. <laughs> Depends largely on, on the calibre of my impressions. Uh, hmm. I, I, I always think to, that the, the Morrissey interview was a particular highlight. <laughs> um, I still miss Richard Dawkins. Yeah. Well, he's, he's still out there somewhere. Hmm. I mean, for people who, who now have no idea what we're talking about, I had Richard <laughs> Dawkins um, in a little glass tank in the studio, and every week we'd start the show with him saying something uh, wise and profound to, to kind of elevate our thoughts into the kind of rarefied atmosphere of deep thought so that we'd then be able to uh, talk about a book. Uh, Dawkins uh, went feral and escaped uh, <laughs> when I ran out of things to do with him. So he's, you know, he's, he's around somewhere. Uh, we had Keith Richards for a little while. Um, yeah, no, it's, it's, it's a ridiculous show. But it's available at uh, fiveminutefiction.libson.com if you want to have a listen to it, if you like a book or a podcast or a podcast about books <laughs> or anything, any combination of, of those things. Give it a listen. It's very entertaining. Sorry, I've made Ian blush now. You have. I don't know how you can see that down the Skype wire, but I've got well, the colour of a bulb. Oh. <laughs> uh, we were chatting online recently, and we were sort of thinking about ideas, what we could have a talk about. And you suggested it would be nice to go back over the X Files, seeing as there's the the new uh, six episode event coming up in February. <laughs> uh, yes, absolutely. Um, I, I I do think it is a, a a very good time to revisit the X Files, and obviously, yes, we we do have um, a six episode event, which is the worst phrase I've probably ever heard. Yeah, what's um, wrong with miniseries? Well, exactly, exactly. I mean, wh- why why they have to be so kind of pitilessly specific about you know the exact limitations of the revival, and just call it you know it is a. Uh, a six episode event it's like saying the new star wars movie is a 124 minute reprise <laughs> you know just big it up don't 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 be apologizing for it out of the box well i think it's good enough you don't need to kind of flatter it just stick it on and let them get on with it well well indeed indeedy so yeah so i've been um thinking a lot about uh, the x files um as as I have been, I suppose for about twenty about twenty three years on and off, I have any any specific aspect of the X Files or just well, the, the as, storytelling. Uh, and... It's um, uh, the perhaps the preeminent narrative format of our time and the mise en scène. But basically, I just really, really have always fancied Gillian Anderson something <laughs> shocking, and that. Was a that was enough to keep me watching the show when 
perhaps it had gone down a little bit of a dip or jumped the shark or or turned into a terrible cul-de-sac of nonsense um <laughs> but scully was always there as a as a kind of through line to keep you coming back for more um and it's it's happening again you know literally i mean reviews are already appearing online for the new oh, really? uh, i think the first episode or two of maybe just the first episode's maybe been shown to the the reviewers who get to see these things a few mm. days before uh mere mortals like you and i mm. um and uh, while it's fair to say they are mixed reviews some of them have some quite positive uh aspects to them so it's all quite exciting well i remember at the time when the series first came out i think it was early 90s wasn't it 92 93 uh, I think it was 93 it was 93 <laughs> yeah 93 yeah um, for sad sci-fi fans in the UK like myself who are still mourning the loss of Doctor Who oh, yes. some four years earlier, this came along at a pretty good time and you had the likes of Star Trek The Next Generation. I think uh, Deep Space Nine, if it wasn't out already, it was pretty much on the horizon. Um, they were okay for what they were, but it didn't really kind of do it for me. But the X-Files had, I don't know... You can't really compare it to Doctor Who. I don't think they're that similar. But I think what I liked about it was that there was a a definite, a sort of a sense of humour amidst all the, what could be quite horrific episodes. Um, I don't know about you, but I found that watching um, sort of fresh as opposed to sort of going back and and reviewing them on DVDs and stuff, I tended to find the Creature of the Week episodes a bit more interesting than the the arc stories. I don't know what you felt about that. Um, well, I th- I think um, there's a there's a lot of things to say just about that. I want you to remember what you just said because I'm going to go off on about three <laughs> tangents. Firstly, the um, it it absolutely, as you said, did fill my uh, Doctor Who hole as well um coming out when it did i wasn't a trek person so yes it was Mm. a couple of years of the doctor who new adventures and and nothing else and then fantastic here we go we've got the x files and it it lasted a very long time which um which really did help um to to sort of cement it in in everyone's affections um and a lot of people if you if you speak to people who remember it in enough detail a lot of people will be able to tell you their first ever episode and nine times out of ten it was one of those um monster of the week episodes Mm -hmm. and i think six times out of ten it was uh the episode humbug in series two where everyone's Mm -hmm. in this awful traveling you know uh circus thing and you've got the enigma the blue guy with the jigsaw tattoos and you've got the Mm -hmm. jim rose guy from the jim rose circus and that wonderful actor whose name escapes me, who had the little sort of um, like weird sort of conjoined twin thing yeah. inside him that was going around killing yeah. people, much like in uh, what was that Doctor Who episode that that ripped that off quite recently, uh, Series Seven. Anyway, um, mm. so yeah, the the episodes, um, the Monster of the Week episodes were a very. Um, uh, it, it afforded the writers and everyone on the show a lot more scope to just do something creatively brilliant in a in a fairly short order kind of um, spontaneous way. Whereas the uh, the more heavy mythology episodes were very much um, <laughs> the exact opposite. Everything was very laborious and kind of. Um, it was it was fairly interesting to begin with because you're thinking, okay, where's this going to go? But I suppose they were the problem they had was because it was such a, a long running show they had to keep on sort of stretching it out and I think by the end for me it got a little bit well it got to the point where it was kind of disappearing up its own absolutely bum. I mean the the interesting thing about the X Files was that it pretty much followed on from Twin Peaks and Twin Peaks was for me at least the first US drama which presented an ongoing narrative rather than just Mm. a kind of anthology format like you know murder she wrote or the a team or any of those kind of shows so Mm -hmm. the x-files had its cake and eating it by having um monster of the week episodes and a long-running conspiracy story which would kind of bookend 
each series and there'd be a, maybe a two-parter in the middle of each series that would that would propel it forward um but it was doing two jobs there it was it was the anthology show and it was an ongoing story and mm-hmm. um and this is something that's become you know so much more apparent now it's it's not even really worth pointing out but because the x-files was the first show i followed uh that was being produced by you know the the american uh tv system mm. you are conscious that the story by definition can't ever end because the guys writing the show don't know when it's going to get cancelled if the show does get cancelled there's always the prospect of a movie or yeah. another movie and another <laughs> movie so much like the the star trek films you know imagine that had been one long story yeah you're never going to sit down and go right well these films make a billion dollars we're going to do one more and then we're going to stop uh so we're going to end the story and we're going to tie up all the loose ends and then yeah. jeff from accounts will come down and go <laughs> can we not stop the movie franchise just now can we do another one so the um they tied themselves in in huge knots with the conspiracy um story mm. uh over certainly over the first 5 years leading into the first movie yeah. and then when the show came back in season 6 and season 6 was a very um key time in the show's history because mm. production moved from Vancouver to Los Angeles because David Duchovny wanted to hang say, out. <laughs> yeah. That was to accommodate him, wasn't it? Basically, he, he he was already thinking, I want to be Hank Moody in a few years. I want to be used to the LA lifestyle. I want to be mm-hmm. out here. And, um, and you had the kind of success of the first film meant that the show was kind of self-aware that it was now a kind of, kind of, a kind of, kind of multi-platform, multi-channel mm. beast. Um, and you had therefore a sort of imperative on the showrunners that they they'd reached a certain level they they'd taken it to this height they'd got a movie there was a playstation game it was all kinds of audio books and novels it was it was a huge massive thing mm. so to kind of keep the show going for longer and to lift it out of its um sort of cult niche yeah they basically thought to themselves, right, well, let's kind of quietly get rid of the more convoluted, complex uh, story arc points um, and then just kind of move forwards as a more mainstream show. Um, and as a in a, in a quite brilliant, jaw-droppingly audacious <laughs> piece of, of writing, they thought, well, rather than do, say, a, a straightforward two-parter that... that uh, shows where we've been going and what this story's building up to. Let's just have one of the characters say say to camera everything that's been going on as a cold open before a totally trivial two-parter. <laughs> and that's what they did. And that, for a lot of people, <laughs> was the point where they thought, right, I'm out yeah. now. I don't I don't need any more. Um, it, it was a... a, a massive misstep but um at the same time i think it was needed because there were a lot of yeah elements that have been had been kept juggling for for five six years mm-hmm. and it, it 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 did need to be addressed i think you mentioned sort of stepping on points and, and first sort of memorable episodes i i remember a friend recommending that i should watch it. i think they were showing it on bbc2 at the time in the uk um and I might be misremembering this, but I'm pretty sure the first one I saw was Squeeze, which was the third episode of the first series. Oh, and yes. what a, an episode to start with that was. Well, that was a, a, a good mm. one. I mean, that's kind of, um, it, it, it's always cited by people when they have a, you know, w- what was your favourite X-File? People will always think of Eugene Toomes mm. emerging from the, whatever it was, little sort of air conditioner vent. Yeah. Um, it it was and 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 it so it it struck such a chord mm. that they brought that character back within that yeah. initial season. He came back, I think, in episode nineteen as well to to make it a nice two part mm. that they could then pedal on a VHS. If any of our <laughs> yeah. listeners remember, I what do. Those I were. had those myself. <laughs> great. Yeah, I did. I did. Wow, that was a whole bedroom <laughs> wall I got back when I switched to DVD. Yeah, just a bit. Um, 
But yes, uh, Eugene Toombs is one of the more genuinely um, iconic creations of the show. Mm. And, and it was a show where you didn't get, initially at least, you didn't get too many because they like to not give you a straightforward black and white yes and no answer. Yeah. So if there was a UFO, you'd see a, you'd see three lights mm-hmm. in the sky rather than a, a massive CGI behemoth if there was a monster you'd see shadows you'd see something but you wouldn't necessarily get a close-up of a a, a huge you know man lizard (laughs) thing um and when it was at its most successful as a you know as a as a horror show Mm. what was when it was playing on that you know the power of the imagination is so much more than than what could ever actually be on screen um and so yeah, you you had a, quite a lot of episodes, certainly in the first two years, I think, where it was all a lot more uh, understated and a, a, a lot more um, powerful because of that. Mm. I don't think a lot of people cite the relationship or the chemistry between Mulder and Scully as one of the sort of driving things of the the series. Mm-hmm. And I going back to it, I've completely forgotten, because I suppose you don't watch the early ones as much, or maybe I don't, um, that the the initial premise was that she was sent into the sort of X Files office to to run an investigation on Mulder. So there was initially that kind of um, insider aspect to it, where you think, well, yeah, is she gonna betray him? But then you get that kind of turnaround where she actually ends up uh, working alongside him, and they make quite a, a good team. That's right. I mean, it was it was one of those. Uh, it was a brilliant idea in sort of in in the pantheon of great ways of creating drama. Mm. Let's oppose these two characters. They're working side by side. They're investigating these things. They both work for the same company, but they want very different outcomes. And that did provide uh, a massive kind of story engine. Um, but I think again because it was largely an anthology show. Mm. Um, and 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 I suppose by the nature of what it was they were pursuing, which was the extraterrestrial uh, life or the supernatural elements, um, if they act, if Scully actually found proof or Mulder actually found mm. proof, then the show's over. Yeah. So um, so Scully was quite limited because they could never produce anything definitive that she could either confirm or debunk. But in a way, that um, makes for slightly more satisfying storytelling because you know quite often they'd happen upon some weird thing going on and then the perpetrator would escape and then they'd be left kind of having lost technically um but i found that quite interesting you know it it just gets boring if you're watching a a regular cop show and every every week they capture the bad guy and it's just uh, yeah exactly well it was also very educational because the the hoops that Scully would have to go to uh, go through to th- to th- to explain away some phenomenon as a natural event mm-hmm. or phenomenon. Um, you find yourself learning about all kinds of things that um, in the the normal scheme of life you 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 just wouldn't. So there's the episode about she thinks it's Munchausen's by proxy mm, or yeah. you know, whatever. You're, and the, all kinds of uh, really bizarre and um, out there kind of illnesses that people might have that explains why they feed on livers and come back every (laughs) five years they're not necessarily a monster um uh, you know the um and it 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 was um quite uh, it's it it feels looking back that it was a bit of a kind of long-running cliche but she would always have a rational explanation mm. and it was on the whole artfully done yeah. and and it, and kept fresh and it it felt honest it, it there were a couple of the the more sort of self-conscious comedy episodes where Mulder sort of folds his arms and sighs and goes right now you do the rational science bit mm-hmm. um and she does her her bit but normally no it, it absolutely was um a really a really good partnering um, and I think it was at the end of the fourth season where she kind of came down categorically and said, "I'm now I'm I'm with him. We've we've found something. Mm-hmm. I think at this point they'd found a microchip yeah, or something right. from from space." Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, you you were always kind of kept guessing with Scully. You never knew 
which way she'd go. Because, of course, the other um, thing with her was that she was a, a cold, rational, scientific person who had really strong faith. Mm-hmm. Um, so there was always that kind of tension of, well, is, is she going to, you know, given that she believes in God and yeah. she's, a, she's a Catholic and all that, how is she going to r- rationalize whatever else they're mm-hmm. doing? in that context. So uh, there were some really quite good layers of, of, of doubt and conflict in the characters as well as between the characters. Mm -hmm. And of course that followed through with the sort of politics within the FBI. So you had Skinner, their boss, who I think for a lot of people was quite a um, major character and he really developed from effectively a guy behind a desk into being quite a hero by, the time they got towards the the latter series, and then you had that the whole thing with the the pressure being placed on him from above by the cigarette smoking man, and all the various sort of people within the FBI trying to help Mulder along to to get his discovery. It, it made for um, slightly more interesting um, storylines, and you had that kind of element coming through that um, everything wasn't quite black or white. You had you weren't ever truly were, sure yeah. who to trust in in the sort of hierarchy of the FBI, which I thought was quite interesting. That's right. I mean, Skinner did kind of... Um, I think his, his role was expanded when it became clear that a, a, an awful lot of, of viewers found Mitch Pelegi, or Pelegi, or however mm-hmm. you pronounce it, to be rather um, a, a, a handsome figure. Um, so they kind of foreground well, him a little glasses, bit more. I mean, well, how could you go wrong? Yeah, absolutely. Um, that's yeah, that's that's me in five years. <laughs> that's me now. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I win. Um, so yes, and he initially was very much, I think, a not 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 a uh, not necessarily a, an opposition to Mulder, but it was very clear that he was only really going to be there saying no or querying his expenses or threatening him with suspension. And it was around sort of series three, I think, where Skinner stepped more towards the light, I guess as a counterpoint to um, Alex Krychek, mm. who uh, was introduced in the second series yeah. when uh, when Scully, I'm going to spoilers now for anyone who's not intimately <laughs> acquainted with the with the show. Scully gets abducted uh, because Gillian Anderson had to be medically away for a couple of weeks because mm-hmm. she was you know, having a baby or something uh, inconvenient like that. Um, so uh, Mulder gets a new partner, Alex Krychek, who seems like a, a, a nice young kid. Um, and within about, I. I want to say maybe eight episodes we find out he's actually a, an, a, an out and out villain who's working for the cigarette smoking mm. man. So you you you're then aware that there is a sort of a, a factionalism within the kind of mythical uh, the, the the fictional FBI yeah. they're they're representing. Um and so you you have you, you, <laughs> to to be really simplistic you have good FBI agents <laughs> there are definitely bad FBI agents mm. there are people like the cigarette smoking man who you don't know who he is or who he works mm. for but he's definitely bad and so i think you if you're doing that on a on a chessboard and you've got these guys over here and these guys over here you need to have some guys in the middle and skinner certainly was one of them um X, who was Mulder's uh, informant, mm. was another one. You were never sure of their motivations, no. um, and it and it gave them so many more sort of storytelling opportunities because you know Skinner can be in it one week as a goodie. He can then be in it the next week, but he's effectively uh, an oppositional force, and it, it it did keep things kind of ticking over. And I think the going back to the monster of the week stories or the standalone stories i think they weren't afraid to play with the format of the show and try different things and i think that kept it fresh as well absolutely i mean some of the some of the most um i'm going to use the word inspiring it's it hasn't inspired me to write television because i don't write for television but but they i think very quickly they realized that the the format of the show being what it was it was going to get quite stale quite quickly unless they could find different ways of presenting certain stories um, 
So in series three, I think you, there was an episode called War of the Copra Frages, uh, where they did a few kind of comedy liberties, which kind of sowed the seeds for the more overtly comedy episodes. Mm -hmm. They would do stories from the point of view of the monster rather than Mulder and Scully. Yeah. So you just see them appearing every 10 minutes in an increasingly threatening way, which was a beautiful inversion mm. of, of the standard. Um, stories where, I mean, obviously everyone, hopefully everyone loves the episode Bad Blood, yeah, where you classic, see the same yeah. story twice. Mm -hmm. You see it from... I think, is it Mulder's point of view first? Yeah, so... Then you see exactly the same thing from Scully. So it starts with Mulder potentially murdering an innocent person, and then they have to get their story straight before they are going into a meeting where they might end up having to face a, a lawsuit from the uh, family of the deceased person for millions of dollars. Um, so they uh, have to right. get their story straight. So Mulder tells his side and then... Or I can't remember which uh, order they go in. I think uh, yeah, well, Scully sell, sells her side first, and then uh, Mulder contradicts her quite amusingly. And you've just and just the the scope of that and what they did so brilliantly mm. was, you know, just the each other's opinion of each other. Mm -hmm. So the way Mulder portrayed Scully, <laughs> the way Scully portrayed, you know, Mulder was this kind of reckless goon who was just basically <laughs> driven by bloodlust. Whereas Mulder, when he was telling it, you know, Scully was this very intimidating, bossy figure he mm -hmm. lives in daily fear of, um, which is absolutely the, the you know, the, the television male-female mm -hmm. marriage Apart from she's dynamic. falling over uh, Luke Wilson, who in his version yes. of events has got buck teeth and is a bit of a hick. That's right, yes. Yes, that was um, <laughs> that was very funny. There was also, I mean, obviously, as the show went on, they 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 took greater and greater liberties with with trying more and more uh, unusual episodes. Um, they did that episode X Cops, which was mm, yeah. almost a found footage episode, where it's you know sort of handy cams and it's done like one of these you know US documentaries where they're live on the streets. Well, we had a series at the time with two policemen, which was a, a big right. hit on that's US right. TV at the time, and it was kind of like a crossover between so the that's, two. Yeah, so that's where that came from, and that again, uh, if you're like I was, sort of a, a, a teenage. British kid who didn't watch that much American TV, you're like, this is amazing. <laughs> this is this is a whole new genre of telly yeah. they're inventing right here. Um, and yes, I think every every season from about season three onwards, mm -hmm. there would be two or three episodes where either there was something in the structure of the script or in the direction or in the, the way the episode was framed. There would be something that just elevated it to... Uh, a, a, you know, real sort of television greatness mm. for me, rather than just being a kind of it's always a seven out of ten experience. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it would be a, it would legitimately be a ten. Sometimes, in fairness, it's going to be a five or a four. But the bravery of the team um, absolutely gave the show that potential to either be brilliant or to fall. You flat mentioned on the bravery. Face. I don't know if you remember. There's an episode called Jose Chung's from Outer Space. Oh yes, yeah, which had you know pretty comedic roots, and uh, there's quite a funny scene where they're hearing uh, evidence from a third party witness, and uh, I think Scully gets described as someone trying to make out that they're a woman and failing, and uh, <laughs> Mulder was uh, completely bereft of any sort of personality whatsoever. And uh, when they're telling the story of where they discover a, a mutilated body, they have uh, David Duchovny screaming at the top of his voice like a little girl, which is quite, quite memorable right. and amusing. Yeah. I mean, those are not unfair descriptions. Um, <laughs> and to, to so qualify that, funny. the way... The way Scully was written was not mm. as, um, you know, she, she wasn't written as a woman, no. first and foremost. She was written as a Generic science walking board. fact fact unit mm. and autopsy performer yeah. who happened to have, you know, long hair and, and you know, lovely little eyes and mm. cute little... Anyway, um, <laughs> and yeah, and, and David Duchovny's performance, um, which <laughs> deserves, I think, detailed ex exploration <laughs> anyway um he he could be very very flat and i don't know if it was david Duchovny trying to be cool or it was molded not really 
being that interested in what he <laughs> happened to be investigating that week. But in the, if you watch the pilot episode, mm. Duchovny is, is very clearly trying to act. He's trying to portray a character who is not David Duchovny. And I think very quickly after that, he may, he sort of rose back from that decision. <laughs> and he thinks, well, if I'm going to be doing this for a year or two, I don't want to be... It. Yeah, I don't want to have to be wearing these glasses and being all arch. So I'm just going to play him very much as as David Duchovny. And that said, it's a, you know, it proved hmm. popular, so... Well, absolutely. I mean, it happens that David Duchovny is one of the most charismatic TV performers, I think, of the last 20 years. I mean, he, he went on to do exactly the same trick with uh, Californication, mm-hmm. um, which also ran, well, ran for seven years. And again, he was only ever playing himself, but you couldn't take your eyes off him. He's just really good. Um, So we're lucky that when he decided, you know, forget what's been written, I'm just going to do it as me. Mm -hmm. It's the actor's equivalent of when Tom Baker said, oh, I could just do this with a look. I don't (laughs) need to learn all this whippet, you know. Yes. Um, Duchovny was right, and he just, he found a winning, uh, you know, a a winning formula. Mm. Because he was in that movie Evolution, wasn't he? Um which was like a sort it of a I, sci-fi comedy. Oh, I didn't watch it. I was very because as a as a fan, and obviously in the nineties, um, I was I was I was the the the, you know, the worst deepest kind of fan. I'd, I'd read all the interviews. Mm-hmm. I'd read all the everything around it. And at the time, you had Duchovny saying, "I don't know if I want to keep going with the X Files." This was around the time I think of season six, season seven. Mm-hmm. He's going, "Yeah, maybe I've had enough. I don't want to get typecast." So all of the, the fans are going, "Oh no, David Duchovny doesn't want to get typecast. Oh, it might be the end of the show." Mm-hmm. And what does he do on his summer holiday from the X Files? <laughs> he makes a film about a guy looking for aliens yeah. i think he alienated a lot of yeah. them, which is See in itself a pun yeah. there uh, uh, uh. um you know he, he, he didn't do himself any yeah. favors trying to carve a new career for himself i did see it at film. the cinema and i can't remember a lot about it but i remember it being quite amusing i think it i might be misremembering but was it harold ramis directed it the guy from I ghostbusters i think it sure. was yeah i think it was yeah i yeah. know oh, because we've been dancing around the um uh, the sort of um, chrome terminator shaped elephant in the room, which is <laughs> uh, season seven and eight, where Mulder becomes a, a very sort of small character. Well, not a small character, but his his involvement is relatively little. For the last, the last yes. couple, and they bring in Robert Patrick. Yes, it was. Um... It, it it was uh, you know uh, uh, as as I was kind of saying there, Tukovny had kind of had enough, I think. And even though he'd he they'd let him write a few episodes, they'd let him direct, they would let him do anything to keep him interested. But he just kind of had enough. Mm-hmm. Um, and there was a very interesting quote from Gillian Anderson. Uh, I think it was in the May. Uh, 1995 edition of FHM which I still have <laughs> where there's some very nice photographs um, but she's interviewed and she, and they're, they're talking about do you think Tim uh, Bisley from Space point, was based on you do you think uh, possibly possibly yeah totally <laughs> actually totally yes um, she was talking about hypothetically that I think they were filming series four at this mm. point and they were asking her how long she could see the show going on for and Gillian Anderson back then said I don't know I can't see beyond you know, another year or two. I think years five and six would be pretty grueling. Mm-hmm. So it always felt like she would be the one to to go first. And I probably would have watched it if, if she'd been the one to have left, but it wouldn't have been anything like mm-hmm. as important, mm-hmm. obviously, without Gillian. But so I was surprised that she was there until the end. But David Duchovny uh, chose to chose to effectively be written out. Yeah. And that, I think, was a moment of real betrayal um, on the part of the writers because, and it's more apparent now, if you go back and you binge watch The X-Files, mm-hmm. you can kind of see it very, I mean, I, I did it, I, I watched, when I was commuting years ago from Brentwood to London, West London, I could do four episodes of The X-Files a day. Mm-hmm. I could have done six if I'd really pushed it. <laughs> But I didn't. I didn't want to overdose, yeah. so four four was enough. Um, and you can you can watch the whole thing really quite quickly. And doing it that way, you can see that the whole show is very much, irrespective of how they later tried to re justify it, 
Um, it's very much the story of Fox Mulder and his search for his sister yeah. and his family and his family history and all of that. And they tried to then sort of wreck on it around series six and go, nah, the show's called The X-Files. It's about The X-Files. It's about whoever's sitting in that chair on this day in history pursuing the supernatural. So Mulder gets sort of, I think, fired from the FBI mm -hmm. off camera and just strolls back into the office and says to Robert Patrick, well, that's me done. Um, you're in charge now. Uh, here's the keys. Uh, go have fun. And... That was the kind of handing, you know, handing of the torch from one male lead to mm. another. And Robert Patrick is then up and running. Um, which was fine if you were only sort of notionally aware of the history of the show. But in terms of the storytelling and the focus and the emphasis that had been placed on Mulder all the way through, mm. it was a massive sort of, no, you can't do that. You can't just end his story in that mm. way. But they did, and it carried on, and... Some people quite liked it. Some people thought it was pointless treading water. I mean, wh wh where do you sit I on I actually that? quite like Robert Patrick as an actor. I think he was pretty good. I think he had a a bit of a uh, poison chalice, really, to take on the male lead after Duchovny, because I think for a lot of well, people... Well, they said that about Matt Smith. <laughs> yeah, that's true. I think also Annabeth <laughs> Gish was really good as well. She came in. Yes, um, yes. Um, both of them, I, I think, did a, an absolutely amazing job. I mean, uh, because Robert Patrick had, uh, after Terminator 2, he totally dropped off my radar mm. and then he cropped up in Series 2 of The Sopranos, okay. which is always a good show to turn mm -hmm. up in. And that, therefore, I think really kind of gave him a little bit of a, a profile boost. So I was interested when he was cast and... Because they they took, I think, quite a sensible decision to not have another Mulder-like figure who just happened to believe all this yeah. stuff. They had a he was a much more cynical. He was, I think, he was a cop. Yes. Um, so he came from that that angle, and that that put a new dynamic into the show. Uh, obviously, you're going to have a new dynamic when you have new leads, mm -hmm. but it also subverted the uh, existing status quo because now. Uh, Annabeth Gish was the uh, believer, and the 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 you know Robert Patrick's character John Doggett, mm -hmm. John Doggett, uh, was the cynic, and that that did refresh things. And I think if the if everyone else on the show had been that little bit fresher at that time, yeah. I think it could have carried on a good while longer than it did. But I think because most of the staff writers had been churning episodes out for you know six, seven, eight years. Um, there was this sense of, you know, we can we can we can keep this going in the short term, but we're done, we're done. Which, yeah, I guess, as you say, maybe looking back, maybe series six might have been the time to just sort of wrap it up. But um, I don't know. I still find it interesting to go back and watch those. They're, it's like watching a different show to a degree, um, which perhaps. <laughs> doesn't uh paint it in the best uh, light but well, you know. no i think i think you're right i mean i think you can you can pick just as many episodes from the final two series as you can from any of the preceding ones there are moments of absolute greatness mm. throughout but there are i think actually no that's not fair i was going to say that there are slightly more clunkers in the later years but i don't think that's true i think They'd got their experimental era. They'd done their Sergeant Pepper's yeah. era in kind of series four, five, six. So by the time they were doing that last couple of years, they were a lot more consistent. And what you're saying is this is the lot Let It more... Be era. Yeah, yeah. This was everything's going to be a seven or an eight out of ten, mm. and that is a, a fairly good strike rate still for a for any kind of TV show to consistently. Hit a level. I mean, you, you know, you watch a, a new show today. Um, uh, I mean, Daredevil was the most recent example. In every series one of a new TV show, there's one episode which is really boring. <laughs> uh, it's normally episode seven, and I think there's some kind of contractual <laughs> uh, obligation to do a really boring one just to give the critics something to have a go at. Um, Daredevil had a really boring episode. I'm sure if I watched the rest of Jessica Jones, there'd be an episode of series one of that mm -hmm. that would be a bit... Uh, 
Um, House of Cards had one. You know, you do, uh, uh, but um, yeah, but but by the time they were doing the last couple of years of the X Files, because they'd stripped out all the story archy um, furniture, and it was it was much more back to its anthology roots. But it was it was almost like the second turn of the wheel. They were they were back in that era of storytelling again, yeah. but they'd already done it before. Mm. So this time. They could do it so much better. And um, it's a very, as you say, kind of underrated era of the show. And the only thing I think that's... So, obviously, at the very end of the final series, um, when they've decided it is going to be the final series, they do a two-parter right at the end yeah, and bring back Mulder. Yeah. And suddenly, Robert Patrick is completely sidelined for the final two episodes and I think he deserved better yeah I think you're right I think they had to obviously give the fans the, the payoff that they wanted but um, yeah it's not perhaps the, the way you want to treat your lead actor who's trying no. to keep the show going for a couple of seasons no I, I think um, I think again that was that was a misstep but um, there were yeah, obviously, you you kind of you know your your heart says one thing, but your brain by the time you're running <laughs> the X Files and you're thinking about ending yeah. it, you have to give the audience um, to a degree. You have to give them what they want. I just I was I was remembering this thing. Um, I went to see Eddie Izzard in about ninety five. Oh yeah, it was it was when he was doing the. The, I think it was Dressed to Kill, where he comes out of a big book and he's wearing a fantastic red velvet thing mm-hmm. and PVC trousers. That's irrelevant. I'm just, <laughs> you know, I just, I, I, li- I like fabrics. Um, and he, he uh, apropos of, of not, well, he's making a point about something else. But th- so this was at the time when the X-Files was like very much the top of the zeitgeist. Mm-hmm. And some, he's talking about something unexpectedly ending. And he says, it would be like if the X-Files just ended at three o'clock on a Tuesday morning and no one told you, <laughs> how would you feel? And if you fast forward about 10 years to, to yeah, when the X-Files actually off, did it? end, <laughs> yeah. it wasn't far mm. off. It was, okay, we're just going to slap everyone in a room. Everyone's going to come out and have three lines to say, oh, I was this all along. Oh, I was this all along. Oh, well, I was this all along. And then everyone gets nuked and it, and it ends. Yeah. Spoilers. Sorry. Um, but then, of course, you've yes. got the, the movie that came out, uh, when was that, 2008, I think, with yes, it Billy was. Connolly, which I've got to be <laughs> honest, I watched it and I really don't remember very much about it at all. So it didn't leave very much of an impression on me, I have to say. Well, it was a very strange um, event, full stop. I mean, so the show finished in uh, 2002, 2003. Um, and it finished on this, not not exactly on a cliffhanger, but as part of Mulder's final adventure, he'd, he'd made it further than he'd ever made it into the um, enemy kind of inner sphere yeah. and he'd seen this computer telling him that the 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 date of colonization of earth by your U- aliens um was going to be 2012 so as a as a as a fan you think to yourself well maybe maybe if they ever bring it back it'll happen around about 2012 so when they announced in i think it was 2006 that they were going to make a new film you thought, well, this is great, and this obviously therefore means that they've got the funding to do a, you know, probably a trilogy, mm-hmm. which will cover this, you know, the next five six years and tell the story of this colonization. Fantastic! So we 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 all trooped along merrily to the cinema, and we got a if effectively a, a monster of the week standalone story, uh, which kind of you know brought brought Mulder and Scully back you know back from where they were mm-hmm. at the end of the show got them got them up and running again um told uh, us you know a so-so to uh, middling to fair kind of story i think from what i can remember had billy Connolly in it as you say yeah. to give it a certain i suppose they were going for gravitas i don't know maybe they wanted him to be funny um <laughs> 
given the subject matter, think, probably not. Yeah, yeah, no. yeah no, you're right. It's, there's the, you've got limited scope for laughs mm. when you're when you're playing the sort of character he, yeah. was, he was playing. Yeah. Um, I'll keep we'll keep it light. <laughs> I won't go into details. Um, and there were some, you know, sort of big name. Uh, Co- was it Ice Cube? Was in it as an FBI agent as that well? That does ring someone, a vague bell. Someone like mm. that. One of the, I, I'm, I, I'm, you know, long hair, guitar, rock. I don't really do modern. Well, he's not modern. This was ten years ago, but you know, <laughs> I don't, I don't know who these people are. Um, and it was, and and then at the very end, uh, just purely so that the audience can get their lighters out and wave them in the air, they bring back Skinner for five minutes just to show that hey the gang's all here and and you know onwards and upwards mm. and, and we can all move on from here so the end of the film was very much kind of okay thanks for that now can we please look at the story <laughs> of the colonization of earth in the year 2012 and then nothing mm. and nothing and it looked like the whole thing was was kind of over so that leads us into the six-part event um do you have any expectations or wishes from this little mini series or is it just <laughs> best to just sort of go in there and sit down and enjoy it for what it is well i think i think you have you have again you have a head and a heart and my head says chris carter is still involved it might lead to some form of new series or new movie, so it's only going to be perpetuating the story. Um, it, as I think most people will know if they've seen any of the the stills or the, even the even the poster for it, mm-hmm. you've got Mulder and Scully, you've got Skinner, you've got the cigarette smoking man who has died more times <laughs> on the television. Cigarettes are very dangerous. Well, clearly not for him, because, I mean, the actor William B. Davis must be about 410 at this point. Um, although famously, of course, he doesn't smoke. No. Um, I think I think he, 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 he quit at some point in his 40s, or or maybe he never smoked, because wasn't he a, a surfing coach when he was a young man? I don't know. Um, so if you watch The X-Files um, and, and you watch him, every time he has one of his famous cigarettes, you go, well, he's clearly not smoking that. <laughs> he's not breathing that in. And... and you know, and don't, kids. Um, so I think it, what we're going to see is, um, well, well, from what we know, so the first episode and, and the last are very much two mythology episodes. Mm. And then we've got a run of Monster of the Week stories in the middle. Hooray. One of which is written by Darren Morgan, who is obviously the, the single best writer the show mm-hmm. I think ever had. So I think what you're going to get is um, a kind of ponderous, overwrought beginning. <laughs> and you're going to get a kind of uh, overly wordy and um, you know cataclysmic finale that, that may or may not engage viewers at all but i think you've got an opportunity in that middle run of four episodes to just do some old school scares and laughs and um and just and just show you know how how Mulder and Scully are different now mm-hmm. how their job is different how their quest is different and what elements of it are the, are the same or would be the same um and I, I think it, it could go literally either way. It could be a, a real um, unfortunate coda to the franchise, or it could it could maybe be the start of a new era. I'm quite surprised that it's uh, found its way onto Channel Five in the UK, which is not really a has uh, it really yeah not really a big profile channel, which worries me. Well, somewhat. I suppose. Yeah, I suppose the BBC can't spend any more money now because no. it's all being taken away no. from them. Um, and Channel 4 have just spent all their money buying Formula 1 from the BBC. Mm. And ITV, no. it's not really no. there. So, uh, yeah, I suppose... Yeah, that's about the only no, place I'm, it could I'm go, surprised, I guess. I'm surprised it didn't go to... Um, is it not going to Sky? Well, yeah, you'd think with Rupert Murdoch's involvement with Fox and well, Sky, yeah, I mean, Fox, it would be... Fox being Fox, yeah. and, and Fox Mulder being named after the network who commissioned the show, <laughs> you'd have thought... The um, Mulder network? 
Yeah, that's right. Yes, the little-known uh, <laughs> yeah. television operator. I think they went on. Uh, shame. Um, but yes, no, that is interesting. And and because uh, I was just reading uh, about an hour before um, we started talking that they've announced that the the new series of Twin Peaks will air on Sky Atlantic in the UK. Mm. So I was assuming that the X Files would be sort of equally, um, or, you know, all over Sky and sort of heavily promoted, mm. but. The Channel Five, and I, I don't want to say anything bad about them, but that is kind of the kiss of death, isn't it? Well, uh, I'm, I, again, my memory is appalling because I'm old. Um, unless I'm mistaken, didn't they run? I'm pretty sure they ran the initial one or first one or two series of The Walking Dead on Channel Five before well, it you may be went right. over to Sky. I'm pretty sure they did. Yeah, so they've got yeah, well, a, that's fair some kind of pedigree with doing sort of cult tv i got into terrible trouble once with channel five you know oh really i was working i was working for waterstones and we used to do a a a job every week where we'd look at all the um tv stations radio stations cinema releases anything that had a bookish angle Mm -hmm. so i could just flag it up for the stores and just say hey guys do you might want to make a shelf of this 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 and this because they're all going to be kind of in the uh, you know uh, pro- prominent this week yeah. and for some reason i was in touch with channel five and i th- the mistake i'd made was i'd I'd use the expression regional broadcaster and they were they were furious oh, they said how dare you call us a regional broadcaster and i said well if i go and visit my parents in essex they can't get channel five <laughs> i live in kent and i can't get channel five i work in west london and we can't get channel five so I don't know where you are broadcasting to, but it's certainly not the nation. <laughs> uh, this was obviously a long time ago, and, and um, they are obviously a proper TV channel. Yes, and yes, they've probably uh, changed owners half a dozen times since you uh, made that faux pas. Yes, well, well, this was the era where they were showing. Um, I don't, I don't know because I've never seen anything on Channel Five because I've never seen it literally because mm. I left the UK a long time ago, so I don't. <laughs> I, I I don't I don't know what they have, but um, that will be something exciting to discover. Yes, yeah. fingers crossed it goes well. <laughs> so, would you, for anyone who's kind of wanting to go back and watch some old X Files just to get themselves in the mood for when the the new shows come on, is there one or two episodes that you would recommend? Oh, well, I could probably narrow it down to about 10. Wow. I mean, I think, uh, and we'll go through it chronologically, um, but uh, you've already mentioned Squeeze Mm -hmm. from Series 1 and the sequel uh, Tombs. Tombs, yeah. Um, They made for a a, 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 a absolutely stunning Monster of the Week Mm. kind of experience. Um, In Series 2, you've got this wonderful little early season story arc um sleepless Dwayne barry and ascension which deals with um scully being abducted and Mulder losing her yeah and having to move forwards and that i think they released that as a as a vhs just of those three mm-hmm. episodes and that was absolutely um wonderful stuff um later on in series two you had humbug which uh, as i've mentioned is is a, a a sort of iconic monster of the week um and one of the very first attempts at doing a comedy episode mm-hmm. it was coincidentally written by darren morgan i don't know if you <laughs> want to take that as some kind of uh through line um because obviously all you know the, the staff writers they had on the x-files you had Howard Gordon, who went on to do 24. Mm. You had Vince Gilligan, who went on to do um, something about uh, making drugs in an ice cream van. I, oh, I've not yeah. watched it. Me either. But I know he's, I know he's, a, he's a figure. Yeah. Um, what else have we got? So Series 3, um, one of my favourite episodes was War of the Copra Frages. That's the Copra, isn't it? Yeah, mm. which again is Darren Morgan. Um, so... Uh, you know, but maybe, maybe I suppose the the short answer would have just been for me to have said, just episodes, go yeah. go and watch all the Darren Morgan episodes. And lots of people do say that, and I think you can still find the T shirt that says "Just watch the Darren Morgan episodes." <laughs> he obviously wrote Jose Chung's From Outer Space, yeah. which you mentioned. Um, where are we? So series four. There were, I think, 
I think a, an awful lot of series four was amazing. Mm. I mean, so episode two, you've got the episode Home, which was that the controversial was freaky episode. As hell. I think I read somewhere um, that Fox actually um, forbade that to be repeated after the initial broadcast. That's right. And it was, for a long time, it was kind of, you know, it wasn't syndicated. It wasn't sold internationally. Mm. I think there was all kinds of, oh, we've accidentally made something really quite near the knuckle. It was pretty um, shocking for the time. It's still shocking now watching it again. It is, it is still shocking now. It's, um, and there's, a, there's that marvellous scene where they're sort of hunched in a, in a pig pen <laughs> and, um, and Mulder's, and, and there's something about pigs and Mulder says that great line about, Scully, would you think less of me as a man right now if I told you I was kind of around? <laughs> Which is a marvellous line I still use regularly <laughs> in, in my daily. This is why I, I never get promoted. Mm. Um, there was, I mean, just coming after that, there was an episode called uh, Unrue where Scully gets kidnapped by... Um, they like to chuck in their German titles, didn't the they? To... They do. There was Heron Volk. Mm-hmm. There's, there's loads more. Um, it, and it did give, um, if you couldn't think of a, a, an interesting title, mm. at least flipping it into a different language mm-hmm. gives it a certain Cache. something. I mean, Series 4 kicked off with Heron Volk, mm-hmm. which sounds very exciting until you know it just means, you know... Some, the men yeah um, <laughs> you know. um paper hearts was a brilliant um episode halfway through that fourth series uh where you have uh it's it's a, a sort of what might have happened to Mulder's sister samantha if she wasn't kidnapped by aliens could there be a more chilling sort of earthbound mm answer to that and that was a a wonderful episode then you've got the trilogy dealing with scully's um cancer that she's been given by the cigarette smoking man or has she um and then small potatoes at the end of that series series five was um slightly more uh conspiracy arc focused but you've got episodes like the black and white uh, postmodern prometheus yeah that was quite a memorable one. which was which was a standout mm. for a lot of people um the pine bluff variant i liked that was good um and then there was one that to... i really wanted to like that didn't uh-huh. quite work was uh, chinga the one that was co-written yes, by stephen king that's right uh, which um interestingly i think i think chinga is it's either Italian or Mexican for a very rude word. Oh. Um, but they had to, <laughs> but they had to ask him to change it from the original title, which was bung honey, which was also nice. Um, quite a, an unfortunate expression. <laughs> I, yes, I didn't, I didn't think much of when they tried to get a, a, a big name writer in. I don't think, cause William Gibson did a couple, yeah. didn't he? And they were better mm. but still i think it was that that it, sort of inner core of writers who produced the good stuff yeah. um and at the start of series six there was a, a huge missed opportunity where you had so the x-files office had been reopened but Mulder and scully had been reassigned mm-hmm. it was now being investigated by um jeffrey spender and diana fowley mm-hmm. and would have been so brave to have just done a, just one episode in that period that began with their faces and names in the credits yeah. and just featured them mm-hmm. follow pursuing an X file. I think that would have been really exciting, but obviously television being what it is and, and sell, uh, contracts being what they yeah. are to and Anderson are not going to let that happen. Mm. Um, but even in that era, you've got this two part, uh, dreamland with, uh, oh, yeah, that Michael was great. Yeah. from spinal tap. spinal tap. Yeah. 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 Um, that was a, a really amazing story, mm. yeah. And, and so you've got this guy suddenly discovers he's in the body of Mulder. There's this hot little red-haired chick who he could probably, you know, if he tried. <laughs> so you've got Mulder acting. I mean, he buys a waterbed at one point, doesn't he? He's like, hey, Scully, come around. We'll get pizza. And she's like, what have you done with Mulder? Was that an inspirational thing? episode for you? Um, that really was, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I then went away and built a... I spent several years building a device that would put me in David Duchovny's body. <laughs> How did that There's work out? Uh, it didn't quite work. I was I was trapped as Darren Morgan oh. for several years. It was yeah, the unsuccessful period of his career. <laughs> I don't know what he's done since The X-Files on the little tangent. No, but he's such, honest, a, such a great writer. Mm. Such a great writer. Um, and I think that's probably... 
th- those are the episodes I'd kind of really pick out. I mean, there's a couple in season seven as well, X Cops, which we talked mm-hmm. about, um, I really and Clyde Hollywood Brookman. AD. That was a good one. Oh, Clyde Brookman's Final yeah. Repose. Well, yes, that was an obvious one for me to mm-hmm. miss because I'm a fool. Wow. But yes, that's absolutely that's that's the that's the in many ways that's the genesis of the Daleks of the X Files <laughs> in terms of like the the essential stories. But there was also one tucked away at the end of series seven called Hollywood AD, where um, uh, Gary Shandling is going to make a movie based on the story of Mulder and Scully. And it's basically an excuse for a lot of TV in-jokes because <laughs> Duchovny would regularly turn up on the Larry Sanders show. Right. And the running joke was that David Duchovny had a crush on uh, Larry Sanders. <laughs> so they subverted that in this episode of The X-Files and you had Gary Shandling and he had a crush on David Duchovny and Taylor Leone, who was David Duchovny's yeah, wife, wife yeah. was playing Scully. And Mulder and Scully and Skinner get flown to Hollywood and, and it's... I, in many ways, it's a it's a terrible episode because it you know it, it does nothing other than sort of massage the egos of everyone involved. But they were clearly having a laugh while they were doing mm-hmm. it. And it's if you if you get all the in jokes, it's a very rewarding. If bit you're on of board with it, TV. it's fun. If not, yes. it might be a bit. You may see a shark in the water with a ramp not very far away. Well, I, th- I think I think you would, and I think that shark would be sort of limbering up to do some fairly <laughs> athletic running, um, which it, it it then did, really, didn't it? One could argue. Let's just say <laughs> one could argue it did after that point. Well, that, I think, sums up the chat about X-Files, unless you've got anything else that you particularly wanted to bring to the table. I well, I, all I would say, Gillian, if you're listening, <laughs> I have been unwavering in my in my love for you since September 1993, and if that isn't commitment, I don't know what is. <laughs> so all I'm saying is, I think you may have a bit of touch. competition, Ian. That's all but I'm I saying. I was there first. Well... But, uh, no, but I've been I've been in this queue longest i'm at the front of this queue now it's not oh. painting Gillian in a particularly good light is it that you're in a queue um gives it, gives the impression it, of some she, kind of payment or a long line she's, of men she's not visiting up. this queue she's not aware of the queue she <laughs> has i imagine nothing to do with the queue the fact is there is a queue we're all just standing here we don't know what's going to happen probably nothing uh yeah probably cut this bit <laughs> <laughs> Is it fair to say that Gillian Anderson's probably had the better career of the the two leads, really, after the X Files? Would you say? I she's had the most varied. Mm. I mean, obviously, she's done film, she's done TV, she's done um, uh, she she's uh, she's done theatre. Mm. Um, Duchovny. I mean, I I really loved Californication. I probably shouldn't have done because it's not a, a subtle or um, particularly brilliant piece of storytelling. But as a show, I think it was excellent. And, um, but yeah, he's he's very much just done two long running TV shows now where he's basically played himself. Mm. So, and I, I and I I think Californication was a very niche show that not many people have probably seen and it certainly hasn't uh, utterly subverted and dominated the cultural zeitgeist in the way that the X-Files mm. genuinely did mm. 20 years ago so for a lot of people he's probably kind of faded into obscurity I mean he's he's addressed this by he brought out a book um, just last year called Holy Cow he also released oh, didn't uh, you review that on your podcast I as it happens yes I did it was it was show two if memory mm. serves um, memory very rarely serves these <laughs> days, which is why I walk around Join the stunned, club. wondering where I am, you know. Um, but yeah, so I think, I think um, yeah, Gillian Anderson's put together a, a, a nice sort of diverse body of work, mm. which looks on paper pretty, pretty bulletproof. Um, I mean, everyone, everyone loves The Fall, mm-hmm. which she's in at the moment. Yeah. Um, and I, uh, because I'm just such a contrarian, and I always have to fly in the face of public opinion. <laughs> I think I think she's she's weird in the fall. I think she's very kind of flat and one dimensional in that mm. show. Um, maybe that's the character. But um, did you see her in Bleak House, the BBC adaptation yes, of Anna and she was, Martin? And she was really was, good in that. She was so good in mm. that. She was so good in that, and and. Um, 
Oh, she she did Streetcar Named Desire, which mm-hmm. was sort of beamed around the world, which we got to see her in that as well. And she's capable of 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 you know real extremes of performing, um, and very different roles and and playing outside of her age, playing you know playing up, playing down. So it's weird that now she's kind of probably more famous for being the woman in The Fall, who just sort of looks very serious the whole time. Mm-hmm than she is for anything else she's done um but she's she's very uh, uh f- fortunate's the wrong word she's in quite a a privileged position as a as a female actor where she can keep working yeah. because a, a lot of a lot of a lot of people do say that if you're a woman the roles dry up when you get to about 35 mm-hmm. and then you can come out of retirement at you know 60 yeah you know in a, in a in a Carrie Fisher kind of <laughs> career bell curve um they just wheel her out um but the, yeah that's that's sort of the the conventional uh narrative of being a female actor so at least Gillian's able to keep working and and do different things and be exciting and inspiring and lovely. I don't know if you will have seen it in your part of the world, but uh, on the BBC, uh, every once in a blue moon, they'll throw up a um, little 30-second um, clip to promote their uh, current dramas, and they've got one where they have um, Idris Elba as Luther, and uh, her she's in it as her character from The Fall, and um, Mr... Cumberbatch as Sherlock doing like a little scene together, which is is quite fun. Oh yeah, yeah. Oh, oh, that would be a. a it's a, it's on the old it's on the old moment. YouTube. So uh, I will have a look. We at might the put a link YouTube. in the show notes if I remember, which I probably won't. That would be marvelous. Go on, do it. Mm. Do it just for me. I shall. Just I shall try. I shall try. <laughs> so, apart from immersing yourself in the world of the X Files, is there something that you would like to recommend? Uh, it doesn't have to be. Gillian Anderson related um, in the world of books or um, movies or TV or music? Um, yeah, all of the above. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I could I could just keep talking all day. I mean, in terms of TV, we are about two months out from a new series of House of Cards, mm-hmm. which is always exciting for me. I always try and clear the weekend so I can binge the whole thing in a, in a two-day I always do that, and then I spend the next week talking like Kevin Spacey as Frank <laughs> Underwood. So I go back into work on the Monday, and I spent the weekend in bed with Frank. And everyone looks well, at me like I'm a crazy Well, if you raise the eyebrows, person. that yeah, well, or not you know, the case, they, maybe. They, no, they know me. They know what I'm like. <laughs> um, and in terms of books, I think everyone, certainly everyone who's got a Kindle, should be downloading and reading the Winter Hill series mm. of of, uh, of sci-fi adventures. Who are they written by, Ian? <laughs> Um, I can't remember off the top of my head. Some uh, handsome bloke um, who's very tall mm. and fit. So if you just um, go onto Amazon, type in Winter Hill, and you'll you'll discover the ser- there's a series of discover, books, isn't there? There's not just it's the one. The, there are there are four of them now, um, and there are there are plans afoot for a fifth. Mm. Uh, um, as when I can make the story work in my head, <laughs> it's it's not behaving at the moment. I've got. I've got bits of plot sticking out at odd angles. Oh, that's that always unfortunate. It's terrible because you can, you know, you can you take some the side out. of a shirt. Yeah. Well, you can, you can mm. in a in a in a real worst case scenario. <laughs> um, and otherwise, you know, I think everyone basically is going to be watching The Force Awakens for the next mm-hmm. couple of months. You know, so we don't need any more movie recommendations or anything like that. <laughs> and I've just started listening to the new Suede album. Oh, We've had a, yeah. We've had a great start to the year. Um, I'm immediately going to come back to that sentence, and <laughs> you have to edit mm. it out because it, musically we had no. a wonderful album yeah. from David Bowie. Yes, yeah. It was then immediately undercut by the awful um, passing of David mm. Bowie. Mm. Um, but nonetheless, there's a, a, a marvelous album from him, and now we've got a new Suede album, and that musically that's a great start to the year. So um, something for everyone there. I think for me, certainly music-wise, I've. Since the awful news, I've been going back through the old David Bowie back catalogue and uh, rediscovering stuff. Were you a Bowie man? I was. I saw him uh, on his outside tour, which would have been about 95. He played uh, Exeter, that uh, that huge metropolis in England. Um, Good evening, Exeter. I'm David Bowie. That's the one. It's wonderful to be here. 
<laughs> not quite that. the same charisma he had, but you know, close, no, close. no, um, no, yeah, so, absolutely. So, yeah, I've, uh, I've been going back through. I've, I've been. I'm so actually quite a, a bad Bowie fan because there were one or two albums I'd not heard before. So things like Young Americans Lord. I'd never heard all the way through. So right. um, that was quite fun actually going back and and discovering that for the first time. So are you are you sort of listening to all of it evenly? Because I, I, I've certainly just uh, done my usual thing of just playing. Um, oh, I've forgotten the uh, I've, I've forgotten the name of the record. Um, <laughs> is it Heathen? Heathen. Oh, two thousand and two. Yeah, it's got it's got everyone says hi. That's on right. It. Yeah, and everyone says hi is is just a, a little disposable, silly, light hearted mm-hmm. song. That I don't I don't even know what it's about. I interpret it as being perhaps a, a a a child going to university or something, and he's just sort of keen to check they're all right and and wish them well and just remind them to be in touch and that everyone loves them. I think Heaven is probably a, my favourite of the the modern albums. Yeah, yeah. I mean that that song for me that just that's so so lovely. Slip and away, just, I think, is the other real standout track. Yes. For Yes, yeah, slip away, mm-hmm. and there's that cover of um, is it Cactus mm, by Pixies? So yeah. Pixies, yeah, yeah. So the, the, yeah, again, there's some really great stuff mm. on that, and 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 the next day, you know, the, the mm-hmm. first, certainly the title track on that album, I can never, never hear that too many times. Yeah. Um, he's he's one of those people who uh, comes back to what we were saying about the X Files, but you can go back to any era mm-hmm. or any record if you compare a record with a, a series of a TV show. Mm-hmm. And there will be some absolute stunners on pretty much anything, you, any any record you go to, mm-hmm. any album, any download for you, for young people. There will be uh, two or three absolutely amazing tracks mm-hmm. and probably one or two that, you know, that are, that are a bit more sort of tin machine. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, let's, let's end this on a high. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Yeah, you're right. Uh, also, right. audio-wise... Um, I've been listening to, I'm a bit behind the times, I'm listening to the first uh, series of Survivors by Big Finish, um, who are probably best known for their Doctor Who audio dramas, but they've uh, branched out into lots of different things now. They're doing a version of The Prisoner and Blake Seven and all these other great properties and Survivors, uh, which was originally by Terry Nation uh, back in the 70s, um, is a, quite an interesting um uh, premise where you have this global disaster where people are falling down dead from this virus which is affecting a huge swathe of the population and then it's about what happens after that and the people left behind so that's been really good i've got one more story to go on that box set and i'm kind of keeping it back because i want um, something to look forward to um so i'm i'm really enjoying that and uh the four of us from the blue box podcast went to Big Finish Day, uh, which was, well, technically it was supposed to be in Windsor, but um, it's actually in Slough. Um, it sounds better if you say Windsor. Um, <laughs> I'm sure most people from Slough do say Windsor. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but that was a really fun day out. Uh, we got to meet some really cool people and uh, JR got to roll a cigarette for Serverland from Blake 7. So uh, yeah, it's all good, it's, all good wow, fun. Wow, was, was she, I, I, I'll be honest, I didn't know she was still going, mm. but... Um, how wonderful. She and Paul Darrow How from Blake amazing. 7 absolutely stole the show. They were hilarious, the anecdotes, and uh, oh, yeah. Yeah, really great fun. So uh, if you get a chance wow. to, to catch one of their events, it's definitely worth checking out. I mean, she was another one. I was I was too young to sort of watch Blake 7, mm-hmm. but I remember it being on, and I remember her. Yeah, um, quite striking Because person. she was an absolutely wonderfully striking person. Mm. Um, yeah. You might have to keep talking for five minutes because I'm going off on a little mental. I'm leaving the Gillian Anderson queue and I'm 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 joining the. Is it Jacqueline Pierce? Jacqueline I'm joining Pierce, that yeah. queue yeah. just because th- there's it's a different queue. You know, <laughs> so, something might happen. You never know. <laughs> well, I think on that bombshell, I will say thank you very much, Ian, for coming on, and uh, it would be nice if you came back another time. Well, uh, thank you very much for having me, and I'd love to come back another time. And I'm I'm sorry for the bits about Q. It was, it was nonsense. In my defence, I have had a mojito, so I'm not in full control. To, to a little bit of accidental partridge there to finish. I'm not legally culpable. <laughs> and thank you very much for having me. Thanks, Ian.